A few days ago, I found an article that went over the top 10 strongest wave controllers and it was kind of a disaster, in my opinion. Overall, the placements were all over, they didn't make any sense, and it was just a strange article overall. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to make my own list, who I believe are the 10 strongest wave controllers in Tower of God. Now, surprisingly enough, as I was putting together this list, I realized that the 10 that they chose for that article are actually probably the 10 strongest wave controllers. Like, overall, I think the choices were fine, but the placements were the only issue that I really had. I also want to make a stipulation that I'm not counting anyone that we've never met in the story itself. So, for example, like, uh, Jan Hanna, for example, or, or Eurasia Blossom. They're not on this list because they haven't been introduced in the story. Obviously, if this was, like, a real, like, all the lore and everything, they would count, but then you'd have, like, six characters from the lore of Tower of God, and the list just wouldn't be as fun for me. At number 10, we have Namo and Sola. Spoilers for the article, this was their number two, and I gotta say, they are not that impressive. Like, yes, they are extremely gifted and filled with a lot of potential, but they have a lot of drawbacks as well. They have to be together, they can't be separated at all, which is why when they were separated, you know, Namo was instantly killed. I mean, they probably would have died to white anyway, but now that Sola is alone, I really don't think she's going to be that much help or even just that powerful in general going forward. But she still beats out, or they still beat out many of the wave controllers that we've met previously, even the ones that are rankers like Yolker. So you know what? Number 10, not a bad spot. At number 9, we have So-O. And So-O has a lot up her sleeve, but I think a lot of So-O's, you know, abilities and techniques, they're more gifted for a support role. So when we're talking about strongest wave controllers, I don't think of So-O, right? I don't think of So-O like taking on different rankers and fighting like that. She's more, I think, gifted at assisting Kel Halam. Now don't get me wrong, she still packs a punch and she's a red witch, so she has a lot of that innate guidance to her disposal, and she can she can manipulate the battlefield in that way, but I don't think it's enough to lend her a higher spot. At number 8, we have Lo Po Bia Ren, the main antagonist alongside Han Sung Yu of Season 1. And Ren is more gifted than we should think, like, the, or that... Now, Ren is more gifted than a lot of us think, or we tend to think of Ren as being kind of a chump, kind of a pushover, right? And he really is not. He's a member of Red, the Royal Enforcement Division, you know, he's a gifted member of the Lopobia family, he's an anima, he basically has multiple bodies, like, there's a lot that Ren has, and just because Yuri, who's, like, insanely powerful, beat him up without, you know, barely lifting a finger, that doesn't mean that Ren is not an extremely powerful wave controller. That said, I don't think he's, like, top 5 material or anything like that, but I am confident in my my placement and that he still deserves number eight at number seven we have the boy kurdan and a lot of people made fun of kurdan's placement on the previous list but i honestly think kurdan does have some things going for him enough to make him number seven higher than ren higher than so -Oh and namo because kurdan is a cutter right? And not is he only a cutter and the only cutter we've seen in Tower of God as far as I know, he's also a member of Walhaik's song, which also says a lot about his abilities and a lot about who he is. And also, he was trusted by Yuri. Like, Yuri was putting together her team and she was like, I need Kurdan, right? And she trusted Kurdan to take out, or Evan trusted Kurdan, to take out Ren and assist Yuri when Yuri couldn't defeat Ren because of her, her role in, in the Jihad army and her role as a princess didn't allow her to do that. That was words. Good gravy, my hair is freaking all over the place. So when you put everything together, you know, he easily defeated Ren, even though he wasn't even there. Again, the anime changed this so that he was there, which, like, defeats the whole purpose of him being a cutter, but whatever. You know, like, he does have a lot going for him. I think we gotta give credit where credit is due with Kurdan. At number six, we have the prodigy himself, Han Sung Yu. Han Sung Yu is known as a prodigy. He is a genius wave controller. Someone who could have been a high ranker is strong enough to be considered a high ranker, 
but didn't advance because he wanted to keep his placement where he was on the second floor, you know, working for Fug, doing all these things. And that says a lot about Han Sung. He's a master at using Shinsu. You know, he's he's taught Bomb a lot of what he knows about Shinsu. The Shinsu loop and everything. He hasn't mastered the Shinsu loop, but he knows of it and can use that to some extent. And he's an anima user as well. He can control Shinwei. Like, Han Sung Yu deserves a lot of credit. He doesn't quite edge into the top five, in my opinion, but I think he could. With these next couple of placements, I think Han Sung would give them a run for their money. At number five, we're in the top five now. We have Doan. Now, perhaps you would disagree with this, but I think Doan should not ever be underestimated. She is also, like Han Sung, a master wave controller using her flower Shinsu and all this to do a lot. She's able to fend off the one uh, the odd-eyed cobra during that flashback we see. And we know that she is a core member of the Hidden Grove. Like, her and Cha are the leaders, dude. Like, the leaders of this, this, you know, master team that is put together to assassinate Jihad or do all these things. And, you know, obviously they don't even come close to succeeding, but, like, it says a lot about who they are and it says a lot about who Doan is. She's someone who has a lot of power and a lot of skill, a lot of technique. You know, the fact that they were going to so much effort with unsealing her from the wall and trying to get her on their side or kill her because she makes that much of a difference. Like, Doan is someone that I feel gets underestimated when she doesn't deserve to be. All right, number four, we have the Slayer himself, Karaka. Someone else who I think is also underestimated too much. Every time we see Karaka, he's fighting Yuri or, you know, clashing with Wyatt or there's, there's things that are happening around him that sort of overshadow his presence. But Karaka is a slayer for a reason. I think the biggest thing that Karaka has going for him is that not only is he a gifted wave controller and scout and fisherman, right? He's able to take all of those roles. He also has so many different techniques and basically is borderline immortal. People always say, uh, oh, he's not immortal. Like, I know, I, I know he's not immortal. I get what you're saying. He, he basically is though. Like he has his heart in a certain location, Karaka's heart, whatever that means. And it basically means he can give up his body. He can move to a different body. He has infinite past lives. That's the name of the technique, right? And just combining all of these factors, the fact that he received training from Jin Sung, he has the armor, which he can do a lot of things with, and he has an army at his disposal, which I know doesn't say much about him being a wave controller, but everything combined, man. Karaka deserves some respect, man. We gotta, we gotta give Karaka the respect he deserves. All right, at number three, we have the 25th Bomb. And this is a weird one for me because Bomb is someone who just recently freaking soared past everyone during his fight with White. And at the end, he did receive help from Kun and Rack. A little bit of help, though. I don't think it was that crucial, but maybe it was. I don't know. But overall, I think that Bomb, in the right situation and with the right factors and everything lining up, could be and is stronger than everyone previously, and you could even make an argument that he's number two on this list. But overall, I think if we take Bomb, considering everything, you know, the white situation was very specific, and even then, uh, it's, it's questionable. I think he deserves number three. We all know what Bomb can do. I think we can move on. And number two on the list, someone who got number nine on the, the CBR article list, which is just blasphemous, is Evan Kell, the infernal Evan Kell. Evan Kell is one of the most powerful rankers in the entire tower, and I know she seems like she's been getting defeated left and right, she got sniped by Lafave, and now we have Widow who is fighting her and stabbed her and everything, it's like, okay, yes, Evan Kell, but here's the thing, Evan Kell always gets back up, and she's like, dude, was that all you got, you know, like, she's, and then she gets pissed off and she beats you up. Evan Kell doesn't get defeated by these situations for a reason. You could say Hockney saved her, or whatever, whatever, but at the end of the day, Evan Kell's flames are famous throughout the entire tower for a very good reason. She killed the previous ruler of the second floor for a good reason, you know what I mean? And not to mention, she has an ancient, which makes everything she has even more powerful, and she's linked with it. We don't know entirely what ancients do, or what they are capable of, or how they function, but overall, she has an ancient, a giant freaking fire elephant, and I think that combined with her masterful wave controller skills, Evan Kell easily, I think, deserves number two. And finally, someone who got number eight on the CVR list, because we haven't seen what they're capable of. <sighs> number one's Gustang, okay? 
We've seen Gustang. Gustang counts. He was in the story. He did stuff. He counts, okay? Gustang is a freaking family head, okay? He's a family head who is a master at using Shinsu, not quite as gifted as his former lover, Eurasia Blossom, but still enough to warrant him easily number one. Like, not even close, man. This man is a... He looked... I was gonna say he's a scientist and studies Shinsu, so that says enough, but he literally stared at Rachel, okay? He looked at her, and she was cured of poison. I mean, what... what what more do you need? What more proof do you need that Gustang is freaking the top dog right now when it comes to the wave controllers, despite the fact that he's not even used his full power? I mean, Gustang, he went and then wiped the memories of everyone on the floor of death. Doesn't, dude, Gustang, family head, enough freaking said. Do you disagree with this list? Do you think there are other wave controllers that I forgot about or should have included that weren't here? I'd love to hear about your thoughts in the comments down below, but thank you so much for watching. A huge shout out to my Patreon for always supporting me and giving me video ideas. You all are amazing. Also, two days from now, this Friday, Towers and Gods episode 12. It's gonna be so much fun. We're gonna be diving into the final test, hunting grounds, the final test on the second floor. And who knows what our regulars will encounter before, during, and after that test. It's gonna be crazy. Really hope to see you there. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And with all of that being said, I'll see you in my next Tower of God discussion video. Take care.